Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. I know a uh, long day. So my name is John Matchett. I am with Accenture, and we're going to have a talk today uh, that talks really about how companies are, are pivoting their businesses to sort of new revenue streams with AI. And you know, when you think about that, it, if you're a lot of our clients are like Fortune 100 uh, companies, but if you're an if you're an executive, right, and you have been running a business and it's time to rotate to something new, it's, it's hard, right? Culture is hard, you don't know how to do it, you don't have like all of the capabilities. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how that works. Um, and then to sort of bring it home, uh, I got a colleague, Greg here, you know, raise your hand, Greg. Uh, Greg's gonna show some demos of things we're doing at Splunk that, that help illustrate that fact. So, you know, when I start, like I always, I like to personalize it. And so one thing I think is interesting to think about is, you know, when we were kids, like all of the stuff that humans had just to do like our, you know, our day-to-day -day lives, right? It's, it's, it's interesting, right? So like if you wanted to listen to music, you had a stereo, right? It was a thing, a physical object. If you wanted to know the temperature, there was a thing on the wall, had like, like uh, mercury, if it fell down, it was dangerous, but kind of cool, right? Um, if you want to know what was playing at the, the movie theater, you could use a newspaper or you could call that line, it would repeat, just like it would go in a loop and say, this is what's playing. And if you wanted something translated, it was virtually impossible, right? You had to actually find a friend that spoke the target language, um, which, you know, super hard to do, right? So, but today, like all that stuff, the stuff, it's gone, right? Like there's, it, it's, you hold up your phone and that's your stuff. Um, and it's all there. And so, but the purpose of today's talk is the fact that like, that this disruption, this transformation that took away all the physical objects we use to interact with the world, it's also profoundly changing the way business is done, like all business. Um, and so that's, that's the thing. And so for a lot of executives, you talk to like very successful people and they're, they're concerned. They can kind of see it happening. They're not sure what to do. At this point, they all know about AI. They know about analytics. You know, so they're much more informed than they were like five, six years ago, right? But they still aren't sure like how do I get started? How do I do it? And so this talk is like, like if you're going to go talk to your clients about how to do it, you know, or your executives or your, you know, your sponsors, this is like the, like here's how you can kind of get started and how you can think about change. Um, so that's what it's about. And I really think it's, uh, it's a really interesting time to be in our markets. And I don't really know like what all businesses you guys are in, but I don't sort of need to know because I, I think there's, a, whatever it is, there's an opportunity, right, to, to improve. I really, I, I personally believe like we're in a situation where if you can imagine like something you want to go do, you can probably go do it right, with all the data and the technology, and, and you couldn't make that claim, like, who thinks you could make that claim 10 years ago? Like, you're always stuck, right? It was, like, it was too hard, like, just doing the ETL was too hard, right? So I think that's the situation, and, uh, you know, it's data, it's ML, it's AI, it's technologies like Splunk that's making all that happen. So I think you're all in the right, you know, you're on the right conference, so that's great. So I'll start my story, I'll tell you a story, I'll start this talk by telling a story about us, okay? so. At Accenture, a lot of our revenue, but not all of our revenue, comes from, from helping our clients with technology problems, okay? So about 10 years ago, we were a $22 billion company doing mostly ERP work. That was our thing, uh, you know, by and large. We did, you know, tons of SAP, Oracle, IBM, like you name it. Um, but times change, and we wanted to change too. And so we put in place a metric for ourselves. We called it the digital rotation, okay? That was the, the name of the metric. And the digital, digital rotation was a measure of how much of our business came from uh, revenue that was derived from the new digital technology. So AI, analytics, cloud, cybersecurity, you know, new technologies like Splunk, that, that's what the digital rotation measured. And, and we wanted to see how much of our business we could you know, like rotate to, to uh, revenue sources. And so about now five years later, we've rotated about 65% of our now $45 billion company to, to this new digital stuff. And, and we're a company that you know, helps companies with change, but I can assure you for us, it, it was a lot of work you know, just to, to get all of that going. So, so I, I would just offer as encouragement to anyone, if we can do it with like now like, you know, almost half a million employees, then like, like, you know, I think anyone can sort of do it, right? Um, so, so I'll come back to that. Like how did, how did we do that? Because that's, that's part of the story too. Um, so that takes us to, there's two ideas we'll explore. The first one we've already hit on a little bit, it's a simple idea, right? But if you want to get into the culture of an organization, if you're going, if you're DuPont or, you know, or Exxon or you're GM, like how do you do this, right? 
so it's, it's, here's the idea. It's like in the future and now, like, like growth is gonna come increasingly less from like physical goods, like a really killer physical thing, just like you know, the thermometer, and it's gonna be from how well you can use information, right? And so, so that's, that's what's gonna happen. And I'll, I wanna prove this point uh, by just showing you some macroeconomic data, okay? So on this, on this chart, you see what it, what it does is it compares the top rank uh, companies from 10 years ago to, to today. Okay, so if you look on the top, you probably see some, you know, you see some symbols that you recognize. And what do you, what do you notice about those companies, right? These are companies that made things. There's a lot of energy, there's a lot of chemicals, there's people that make engines. They make physical things, almost, you know, almost all of them, right? Um, now, compare that to 2019. Look at, look at the logos. I'm sure you know a lot of those logos, right? Increasingly, what you have is companies that, that, that don't make physical things. They make ones and zeros. That's how they're competing. And the only company that's on both lists 10 years later is Microsoft, right? So that's, that's sort of interesting to think about. Now, when you look at this, like what's your takeaway? Do you think this is a story about tech companies? Is this, is this a Microsoft story? It's, it's not a Microsoft story. It's a story about the customers of those tech companies. That's, that's the, and how they want to use technology to become, become digital competitors, right? That's why people are at this conference. So that's the big takeaway. You know, one of our clients is the world's, one of the world's largest brewers. They make beer, right? Like, so do you think, like, beer is a digital industry? You know, I want to show a hand. Do you think beer is a digital industry? It's a, it's a thing, right? So, you know, but you gotta ask yourself, if you're a brewer, like, how are you gonna get better? Like, like everyone knows how to make your beer. The Egyptians could make beer, right? They know how to do it. Uh, and, and the beer makers can pretty much make whatever beer, you know, they wanna make. They're, they're, actually, they're, they're good at it, at scale. So if you're gonna get better, like one of the ways is to use digital technologies is to touch your customers better, right? Like digital marketing to do better segmentation, pricing, new product introduction, bundling, uh, you know, really like really amazing micro segmentation like advertising on this block looks like this, but on this block it looks like that. Um, so that's, that's the future of, of, of brewing, right? It's, it's digital, it's a digital company. And, and I think, you know, so if you just think about beer, like like, could any industry be, you know, transformed? Uh, I think the answer is yes. Like that's one of the most profound things I try to tell my employees. You know, is is like you got to believe. Like it's a it's a it's a new world of opportunity. And to prove it, I I, I got a little thing I like to do. Um, so how many people here in the last month have taken an Uber or a Lyft? Like everybody, right? Like everybody. Okay, so let's compare, let's compare the 2000, the experience of, of, of transportation now to like 10 years ago. Just, let's just, and I know you know the story because like you do it, right? So let's just take a look. So I'm gonna click through this here. In 98, like what it was like, you got in the cold, right? You, you, and, but today you can stay in a warm lobby. 98, you put your arm out there and kind of wave around, it's, you know, but try to get someone's attention, but now you just press a button. Uh, you have no idea in 98 how long it would take, but today, you know, you, you, got the, you got the app, right? You don't know, in 98, you didn't know anything about the driver, the car, anything. Today, you got all that data. That's kind of cool, that's different. You know, 98 and today, by the way, you step into a really dirty taxi, there's probably a bulletproof thing, there's no room for your knees if you're over 6'2", you know, it's like, not good, right? Today, it's probably clean, and if you get a black, it's certainly clean. Um, you know, then you have to talk to the person. Like, they may not know in Chicago, where I was for years, like, they may not even know the city, right? So now you're gonna talk to them, no, take this. No, but today, it's just like GPS, it works. Uh, the payment in the old days, remember that? They might have changed, you have changed, is a car to work? Like, who knows, right? Can you break 100? Like, whatever. Like, today, you know, just easy, right? Automated. And lastly, you know, you get out, is, do you need a receipt? Is it gonna work? Probably not, you get out without it, like what are you gonna do in your expense report, blah, 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 right? So, but today it just comes, right? So that sounds pretty good, right? Now, this story gets told a lot, and all of you, you know, use this service, right? This new service. So do you think just because we did like transportation experience, like every other industry is, are, are we done? Is, you know, let's take another example, okay? Let's say you're at a little league game, you're watching some kids play, and there's an injury, it's not life-threatening, maybe it's a bad sprain or something, right? And now you gotta go to the ER, and so it's, you know, the kid's gonna be okay, but a little adrenaline, you're trying to get there, and you gotta deal with that situation. So let's compare that experience from 10 years ago to today. Like, what does that look like? 
Okay, so the ER experience. Okay, so let's try this again. Okay, so in 98, you walk in. Today, you walk in. 98, you check in. Today, you check in. You know, in both cases, you sit down. You have no idea how long it's going to take, so you wait and you wait. Uh, in 98, you read an article about cell phones, perhaps. Today, you read an article on your cell phone, right? Uh, finally, you get called up. You prevent all of your PII. In both cases, it's manual, and you, write, you rewrite the same material that you've written hundreds of times in the past. Um, you go back, you listen to some music, and, you know, 10 years ago, Spice Girls in your CD, now it's like Taylor Swift and the Bluetooth, right? You try not to get sick to the person next to you in both cases, and finally, you get called in to go see the doctor. So in other words, in, with this experience, like what's changed? Nothing, nothing has changed, right? Do you think that the ER experience is the sort of only unchanged experience? No. Like, like I think when you, when you walk out the door, if you start thinking about this example, you'll start seeing like opportunities for transformation everywhere you go. So I think you know this is an important point. Just like it's you know it's just, it's time to sort of believe it if you can do it. They can take all this like Splunk technology and and go you know use it. Uh, there's boundless opportunities. So this is the kind of disruption I think is available everywhere. So. Let's switch on. Let's let's talk about this disruption. So we're going to move into like, okay, so how do you how do you like do it? How do you what's your framework? So the first place I would start with disruption is just to like define like if you're a disruptor, like who are you? Like what are you doing? Uh, I think it's a good place to start. So if you're a disruptor, our definition is pretty simple. You what you do is you unlock trapped value, value that was there, but it was you couldn't reach it because of technology wasn't there. Maybe there was regulations, maybe there was like something about our norms in society, but as those things change, you were the one to untrap the value, right? That's what disruptors do. So we wanted to understand a little bit more about what industries are facing with disruption today. So we did, we did a couple of studies, I'll talk about two real quick. Um, but in the first one, we interviewed 3,600 uh, uh, C-level clients, a lot, in other words. And we asked them just about trends in their industry, what they're seeing, and then we got a lot of data. And what they self-reported is about 64% of them thought there was uh, a significant amount of disruption in their industry, but only like 15% felt they were prepared, which is understandable. Like, like yeah, if you just sort of check your own pulse right now on your industry and you ask, you might feel the same way, I'm sure. That's true, but, but what we also found was that like, disruption has a very understandable pattern. And if you learn the pattern, then you begin to actually put in place your plans to sort of dealing with this disruption. So that's what we learned. And, and to make the pattern, like to talk about the pattern, it's a little busy slide, but you, you're smart people and I'll talk you through it, right? Um, so, so here's the pattern, here's what we see. Like on the, on the uh, vertical axis, which is, you know, the, it's the current level of disruption in an industry. So how much disruption is going on right now? And the horizontal axis is how much disruption is going to occur in the future. Okay, so if you're a company, you're somewhere in one of these, it's a Cartesian grid, you know, you're somewhere in one of these, these grids. So in, in, the, uh, in the bottom left, you have this thing called durable. There's something about your industry which is, makes you, you know, resilient to change. There's some structural protection, you know, like in the drug, uh, there's regulations, for example, for American drugs where you can't import them from overseas. So that's a structural protection, right? Um, Right above you have what we call viability, so there's been a lot of change, but there's not more. So you're probably in a new or industry or something that's just been transformed. A lot of software companies, by the way, are kind of there. Over in volatile, what you see there is you not really have a lot of change, but there's more coming. Probably what's happening in your company, in your segment, is that uh, something that was historically a source of strength is, is, has eroded, right? So if if American, if the Congress decided, no, we could import like drugs globally, like that source of protection would go away and you would see tremendous change, I think, in that industry. Um, and then lastly, a vulnerable, so not yet a lot of change, but there's something, you have some source of protection which is preventing disruption, but you haven't got there. So you gotta kind of understand where you are. So part of our methodology of the study, it's a little hard to read, but I think you get the slides, is to go, we just actually had, by our own definition, we went and mapped um, all of these industries. Um, and so what we found, what the data showed us is in fact about 65% of companies are in fact experiencing a lot of disruption as we speak, right? 
Um, and, and then about another 44%, you know, we expect more. But I think the takeaway, if you're reading this slide, is there probably is no safe quadrant. So in durable, like we see automotive, is, is kind of in the upper, upper uh, right-hand corner. So auto, you can see why they would be durable, right? Like, like they make big, heavy objects, and it's hard to go jump into that industry, right? It's not like digital banking, where you can just like have a bank on your phone. You gotta make a car at the end of the day. But that industry, uh, what's happened with, uh, in, in, in auto in the last five years is the, the price to earning ratio from the car makers to their suppliers has diverged by about five points. They used to be equal, about 10 in each case. The PDE was 10. Today, the PDE for most of the German car companies is down to seven, and that of their suppliers is up to like just over 12. So they've had like, like that much divergence in, in a very short period of time. Um, and so there's something about the market that's valuing the suppliers more than the car manufacturers. And what it is is three mega trends, three disruptive trends. There's ride-sharing, autonomous vehicles, and electric vehicles, right? Those three alone have caused like the market to say, you know, we value the suppliers who are making all those new parts for that new stuff less than the actual finished OEM product, right? That's, so do you think they feel safe being durable? I don't think so. What about chemicals? They're down there too. You could imagine chemicals is a really hard industry to replicate. It's a, it's a you know, large industrial process. It's difficult, you need specialty skills. Um, not easy to jump in that game. But if you're in the chemicals industry, there's less concern about like new competitors as they are like the efficiency of their operation. And specifically what they've discovered is that, uh, I mean we've been doing, humans have been really good at chemical engineering and chemistry for over 100 years, right? And we have invented a lot of things, Kevlar, nylon, they're all done like the 50s, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s. And each successive decade, the, the new blockbuster products, just like drugs, for example, are slowing down. And so what is their opportunity to improve? You know, what they're looking at are things like ML and AI to do better predictive maintenance in their plants. Like there's a huge amount of money. You know, a, a plant may have 100,000 sensors in it, and each one of them might have three bots looking at the sensors. And so now you have like 300,000 uh, robots looking at 100,000 sensors, making you know, millions of predictions every day about what's happening. So at least to better safety, quality, you know, on-time delivery, I mean, all these sorts of things, right? So that's, um, that's what's happening in that industry, right? So, okay, so if that's the pattern that, that we, we, you know, we used to sort of map companies to understand like what's your risk and what should you do, you know, the question now is like, like what should you do? Okay, and that takes us to sort of I do two, and this is how we advise our clients, by the way, is you gotta do two things. It's not really an or, it is definitely an and. Okay, here's the and. Um, thing one you've gotta do is across the board, you've gotta go into your core business where you make your money today, today, and use like ML, AI, new, tech, new data sources to just do, um, to do things differently. To do what you do today, but do it better, right? The other thing you've got to do, though, is, is, is go find ways to do different things. This is where it gets more interesting. And you see a lot of crossover. A lot of our clients are definitely in this space. Um, so just like in the health space, we have retailers, ones that you've probably been to in the last week that are jumping into the health space, right? You've seen that. Um, we work with uh, de healthcare device manufacturers that makes sense, and they also are providing healthcare, right? So there's a lot of ways to sort of cross over into sort of different industries using your knowledge, your data, to jump into some adjacent you know, area. And we'll, we'll talk about sort of how you do that. Um, so so that's, that's what that is. So we want to understand like who's really good at doing this. I told you like our, our pivot story, how we wanted to be you know, this, this, this pivot. So what, what, what's the market doing? And so we, the second study we did was look at, well, who's actually good at that and, and, and what are they doing? So we did another study. This one had uh, we 1,400 uh, comp uh, executives we interviewed. And what we discovered is about 6% of companies were actually really good at sort of this rotation to the future, okay? And the way we measured that, by the way, is if in the last three years, if you were an established business who had legacy revenue streams and in the last three years um, you had developed new revenue streams and now over half of your, your income came from these new sources, then you're pretty good. That's hard to do, right? Think about a legacy business where you can like generate half of your income from brand new, net new sources. Um, so about 6% are really good at it. And, and those companies, by the way, they, they, were, they had triple the uh, opportunity to, to grow the revenue at 10% or more, and they were more profitable. So they're doing some, you know, they're, it, obviously, you know, it works, right? But, but it's hard to do, or more companies would be doing it. Um, so here's the, here's the process that we 
we advise our clients on, how we, how we do it. Um, and there's a whole, we just read a whole book on this actually. If you go out here and you Google like uh, Wise Pivot, uh, Omar Abash, like there's a whole book you can read on this. It's, it's a good book. Um, but first thing is you gotta do things differently. So what we do initially is we help our clients transform their core business. So the chemical example with predictive maintenance, that's a good example. We're gonna look at a supply chain example in just a little bit, but ML is taking over supply chain in ways that are really like amazing. I grew up doing a lot of supply chain work and what's happening now is more interesting than anything that's been ever happened in that industry. The purpose of transforming the core is to generate cash that can be invested in other activities. You've got to generate more money. If you want to grow new businesses, it takes money. And so the purpose of this is to generate excess money to invest. But that's not enough. This is another thing you gotta do, and some, some clients I think are prone to skip over this one. You gotta grow the core, right? So what does that mean? That is about you know, using new digital marketing techniques like we discussed in beer making to go find more customers, better customers, to have them to have a better experience with you so they want to come and, and work with you. you know, can you get better offers? If you understand what they're talking about on Yelp or Facebook or you know, all recipes, if they're you know, talking about like cooking, can you go make a bundled offer to talk about like how to pair beer with, with food? You can, and we do. Right, that's the kind of thing. So, so again, the idea is to grow more cash. And so there's a lot of ways to do that that tend to be more sort of marketing oriented, experiential. And last, you gotta do this thing where you gotta actually have to sort of scale the new. And this is about finding net new adjacencies in your business, like I was talking about with healthcare, to stand up new, new sources of, of, of cash. So that, for most companies, is hard to do because they don't have the skills, the experience, Oftentimes in organizations, there's like the you know there's you know white blood cells that'll go kill foreign you know bodies. I'm sure you see it you know in organizations you've been around. Um, and so to do that, you need some new skills. And to get that, if you're like anyone else, you're probably going to have to use like JVs or JIs. Work with academia. Work with open source. You're going to have to go find some new partners that you probably don't have today. Right? That's the way that works. But to pull this off, there's a process that we've been working with. This, the book actually is about this process. Um, if you want to do all of that, there's a new process that is really is the responsibility of a CEO and the CFO, and that is to do this sort of pivot. So at what, what is the rate at which you will regulate cash outflow from legacy businesses that you've now improved with AI into AI-enhanced businesses? Right, you go too slow, you're probably not in business. You go too fast, and you're going to strangle the cash that you, you know, the, the cash cow that you have. Okay, so so that's that's the process that we uh, uh, take our clients through, and and for each of these areas, there's you know there's there's many many ideas, whether it's supply chain or operations or the, how you do fraud and risk. You can't point to, you know, an area in most organizations where it couldn't be enhanced with uh, you know some of the new AI technologies. So to to do that, Greg, my my colleague. Um, is going to talk a little bit about some examples we're doing actually with Splunk um, that, that focus in the supply chain space, primarily up here in this transform the core area. So Greg is going to show you some Thanks, John. Some stuff. So as John mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, one area that we're seeing a lot of change is apl application of ML in the supply chain space. And I think supply chain is really interesting right now because clearly it's always been a quantitative analytic you know, endeavor. However, what we're seeing now is that we're bringing advanced analytics, there's a proliferation of data, even things like the use of platforms, you know, the different cloud platforms and the providers that allow you to scale things out and see that supply chain from an end-to-end -end basis. And I think what's really changing in my opinion, because I come from more of a consumer analytics background, is the idea that if you really have an end-to-end -end supply chain analytic path, you really do fully understand that customer demand and the market signals that need to drive and upstream that entire supply chain. So we're seeing a lot more integration of those analytics. And I think that's a really exciting change that we're, we're going through right now. And so there's a lot of opportunity for new ways of looking at existing supply chain operations. So what we're gonna look at today is one specific area which is really just for supply planning and a solution that we created called Jarvis. And the backstory to this is just a few months ago a client came to us and said that they have a problem they'd like us to help them solve. And the problem was that they had a large regional warehouse for a fairly high ring product that was extremely seasonal. 
And the warehouse also needed to stock thousands and thousands of variants of this product. So uh, without giving away too much, it's just, it's a complex situation. And they were still sort of stuck in the 80s. You know, like they had a lot of spreadsheets, a lot of local knowledge, a lot of decisions were being made at the warehouse level that were not really optimizing the entire solution. Uh, so they were creating local decisions that might make sense for a specific product, but would throw off the entire, uh, the entire uh, warehouse operation. And, and part of that we see generally is that you, know, you have fragmented ERP systems, uh, you know, as John mentioned, forecast accuracy is a really big thing. If you could create better forecast accuracy, a lot of these problems could go away. They just really didn't have visibility into their inventory positions. Uh, and in this case, the client had a lot of manual effort, uh, just a lot of spreadsheet entries. And so when we talk about what that results in, you think about like stockouts and excess inventory, uh, the client had both at the same time. So the problem was is that there was this long tail of really slow moving items, yet high ring items, that just had way too much stock on hand because they had no good way of forecasting demand for these items. So they're holding lots of excessive inventory for those rare occasions these items become hot. That's very expensive to have that carrying cost of all the inventory. At the same time, those fast moving items that were highly seasonal, they were going out of stock quite frequently because they were not able to accurately predict when those items would be uh, needed to be in the warehouse and be shipped out. Uh, so they came to us to help solve that problem. And the approach we took is, uh, working with Splunk to create a solution. And that solution allowed us in Splunk to bring in all the different data sources that they needed to ingest. So sales history, product information, uh, inventory positions in the warehouse, open orders, forecasting, supply constraints. And so just bringing that in very quickly in flat files, we're able to ingest that into Splunk uh, and then do things both in Splunk and then there were certain routines in the supply chain space that were very specific to this business. Certain algorithms that they had to implement uh, for these types of products that we actually used ex external Python scripts that we called directly from the SPL scripts, which was really cool. So even things that we didn't want to do directly in SPL, we were still able to write that routine on a Python script, call it directly from the SPL, and it was completely uh, sort of seamless in how that data was passed off. So it, was, it allowed us to develop this very rapidly. And then we also used some of our internal tools to do some of the really cool bells and whistles stuff, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, I think the key message here, though, is that when we initially spec this out, if we sat down and did this with a traditional solution where you have a, a set of routines to ingest your data, you know, ETL transformation routines, you find your data source to support it, and then you build out all your analytics using a variety of tool sets, then maybe you use Tableau or Power BI as your front end visualization, that entire process we estimate would be a six to nine month effort to deliver the first prototype solution to the client. In this case, we delivered a working version to the client in eight weeks, and then over a few weeks after that, completely refined it and had it up and running. So we were able to do this very quickly, and a large part of that was due to Splunk, because it took away a lot of the friction of us getting the data in one place and actually working with the data. Uh, so the client saw a lot of uh, you know, very significant benefits very quickly from the solution, uh, but it really brought together a variety of things, such as machine learning to do product segmentation within the warehouse, uh, AI-based optimal order recommendations, uh, intelligent safety stock settings, uh, descriptive and predictive alerts for various dynamics within those product segments. And then what we did that was really cool was in order to make the analytics more democratic, you know, make sure more people had access to it. Because one of the problems the client had, it was all siloed. You know, one manager in one side of the warehouse had his spreadsheet and knew that segment of books and another guy in another part of the warehouse knew the you know, detergent, the solutions for that, and across categories, no one knew what was going on, right? So um, we created the smart chatbot that would allow anyone to query the analytics and get intelligent answers without even needing to go into the system to uh, look at dashboard reports. So just to give you a quick idea what this looks like, uh, when we built the solution, we created a landing page so users wouldn't even initially see the Splunk interface. We, would, we built this in Splunk using you know, the capabilities within Splunk, but created a very friendly uh, you know, user interface that would allow them to go directly to the reports and the analytics that they need. And then it allows them to do, for example, with the alert dashboard, give you an overview of all the processes in the warehouse to understand where there might be a problem and how things are performing. Uh, very specific dashboards in Splunk that gave into great detail on our supply planning and give you a full overview of everything going on in the warehouse, our trends, our sales, our inventory positions. And then we finally came up with a recommendation table. So based on our current stocking today, 
and what our forecast looks like over the next few months, what do we recommend in terms of optimal order quantity moving forward? So we're, tar we're taking decisions that were made sort of by gut feel by managers within the warehouse and transforming that into an analytic-based decision based on data and routines and analytics that would drive that optimal order quantity recommendation. But then we still made sure using the planning parameters uh, layout that the user could go in and specify specific parameters because you don't want to discount the local knowledge of the people on site. So you don't want to just take them out of the loop. So by having the planning parameters in there, they're able to go in and do things like set safety stock and make certain assumptions about order lead times and things like that and even override like higher level system settings if they knew for a specific product segment they needed to change that. So it did give them that control over the entire process so that then that recommendation table would reflect their local knowledge of the business. And then finally we created the chatbot which uh, was based in a Skype interface that allowed us to create a bunch of natural language queries so you could just type into the chatbot uh, tell me what my uh, out of stock inventory looks like or tell me inventory that potentially could go out of stock you know in the next three months and using natural language processing and, and analytics the chatbot would parse that query pass it into Splunk and then return that query directly in the chatbot along with a link that would then allow the user to go directly to the Splunk report that generated that query so again it just gives them a chance on their phone uh, or on an iPad to get access to the data in a way that's much more transparent, frictionless than uh, having to even go into the system in the first place. So I'm showing you just screen caps of the demo. If you'd like to see this live demo uh, in person and up close and all the different dashboards behind it, uh, please go to our Accenture booth. Uh, we have a full-time demo station set up there. I actually will be manning it a couple hours from now for a few hours, but right now there's other people there as well. And they'll be happy to take you through the entire workflow of the application and you can see uh, firsthand uh, the different planning dashboards and, and how we put this together. Now where it gets really interesting is that, as I said, we had one client come to us and say, help me you know, solve this problem, which we did. And, and we did a lot of work in the background, so I mentioned Python scripts, you know, there's a lot of advanced statistics in here with PCA segmentation, machine learning to do clustering and advanced analytics for forecasting. Uh, and then just figuring out how do we create the analytics to completely refine and tune these, these things. And then all the added stuff we put on like the chatbot. Uh, but what's cool about it is that we don't stop there. Because we built this in a way in Splunk, it's actually very scalable to other client problems. So in the time since that we built this, we've had two other client opportunities in completely different industries but the mapping, the problem mapped to the same type of solution. So even though they were in completely different industries, they had a similar situation where they had a warehouse, they had limited connectivity to all the information in the warehouse, and they really didn't know what was going on and had bad communications, bad planning, and it was costing them a lot to carry excess inventory, and they were having poor customer satisfaction because the key items that the customers wanted were going out of stock too often. And so what we were able to do is, you know, I spent like eight to nine weeks to build this actual solution for the first time on Splunk. In terms of now shifting this to other client scenarios, that could be done in like a, a two or three week time frame. So we've got the sort of the infrastructure that we built in Splunk and we're able to very flexibly modify that. And that gives us a lot of leverage because we kind of think about this idea of pivoting to the new, that we can quickly take this and, and just scale it out across different clients. And because Splunk scales so well, it doesn't matter if this is you know, a small warehouse or you know, a multinational distribution center, but we're able to handle the, the quantities of data that are coming in. Uh, so I think that was a key uh, insight for us is that by using Splunk as our foundation, we were able to build this tool out very quickly, embed it with a lot of really advanced analytics, and provide value at the end of the day for the client in a way that's very easy for them to ingest. Uh, so it was a really exciting project to work on that had, had, had a lot of very uh, you know, definite benefits for us. And fun to work on too because you know, creating the dashboards and the visual license in Splunk, as you know, is, is actually you know, very nice work to do. It's, it's very clean and neat. Uh, so that's our example, but please do stop by our uh, booth later on and uh, check out this uh, you know, hands-on view of this demo. It's, it's a really cool example of what we can do with analytics and uh, a platform like Splunk to kind of advance the state of the art. So thank you. Thanks, Greg. Uh, super cool. Like the stuff that's happening in supply chain is like really amazing. Um, so just like to, to wrap it up, like 
I think you all are now ready to go talk to your stakeholders about your own pivot to the future, but uh, just some things that we talked about that we think are all, all, all really relevant, like pieces of the puzzle, if you want to pull it off. One is this concept of hyper-relevance to your customers. Like any solution, if you think about it, if you're not hyper-relevant to your customers in today's market, you probably are on the wrong path, right? So like this, 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 this concept with, you know, do you, do you know well enough to have the right offers and pricing and bundling? If, you, if the answer to that question is no, it, you, you need to work on your solution. Um, this, this next thing is network powered. Like there's no, you can't compete by yourselves anymore. Like the, the old days, like where, you know, you have one company with a, uh, just one monolithic capability is, is not the way it works. And so you're going to go, you know, compete with partners. And so like thinking thoughtfully about like your partner ecosystem, I think is, is very important. Um, technology propelled. This one sort of is like obvious at a conference like this one. But, you know, a lot of companies didn't compete with technology. One of our clients is a... Uh, uh, they, they make liquefied natural gas, and they're really, really good at it. That's what they do, but, you know, they're chemical engineers, and they decided they wanted to sort of be, you know, digital competitors, and they realized they didn't have, as smart as they were with all their chemies and their geologists, they didn't have, like, data scientists. They didn't have people that knew Splunk, right? They didn't have all this quant stuff, and so they had to go build it. And so, you, you know, like, that is uh, important. The talent rich, this is an important um, thing as well. What happens with the turnover, of, I mean, who had heard of Splunk five years ago? Uh, yeah, a few people, right? Like, right? It used to be if you knew like SAP, SD, their sales and distribution module, that skill set was good for 10 years. You were set, right? You knew it, right? Um, that is not the case anymore. And so the concept with talent, is like the war is really about talent. It causes everyone to think about their people sort of differently, right? Um, then uh, absolutely data driven, like like what is it's so unique with like like the, the not only the vast array of data you have, structured, unstructured, how you can actually use it, um, but also the ingestion patterns, whether it's like lambda or, or batch or whatever, you can use all of it. And so like a, a culture that um, uh, can put that in play is important. Um, the next is inclusive. We think this is very important. Like ideas, are st the rate of change is so p fast. You know, you got to be on the lookout for good ideas. And so a really uh, diverse, uh, you know, uh, workforce, diverse of thought uh, is, is absolutely critical to, uh, to succeed. Um, and the last, for any industry, you've got to be asset smart. There is no industry in, on this planet that's going to be rewarded by underperforming assets. A lot of the stuff we just talked about, this Jarvis solution, supply chain, um, it, you know, a lot of it is just to get the, 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 the efficiency of your capital uh, in play. And, and particularly where there's like vet invested capital and heavy equipment, that sort of thing, it's even more necessary that it operates fluidly because there's just, there's no, there's no upside anymore and the market, you know, will punish, will punish that. So these are some pieces I think if you pull all these together, you know, you can, you can pull off your own, your own pivot to the future. So thank you for your time. We're happy, I'll be here for questions if you want to talk more. Thank you.